Hey, welcome to The Weekly, where we're connecting our services over the weekend to your real life lived Monday through Friday. I'm one of your hosts, Thomas Milburn, with my co-host, Jay Ewing. How's it going, my friend? Man, it's so good to see some snow arrive on the front range. Snow wonder, it's January. It's amazing, isn't it? Did you say snow wonder? Yeah, totally. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Put that in your dad joke book. Hey, man, I had a... No, I had a... Uh, <laughs> I had a sweater that said that one that says, no wonder I love my grandchildren. It was my ugly sweater for Christmas for Ooh, a couple nice. of years. That's classy. Yeah, it was classy. Hey, but I love the snow. I do too. I just love the seasons. Like it changes. When the kids and I were up this morning, we were just seeing the snow come in, just reminded, man, how great is it that the Lord promises to make us white? Oh like man, snow. Psalm 51. And then I was on the Boulder campus this morning and I saw a bunch of goose poop making the <laughs> snow dirty and nasty. Oh, yeah, man. The geese are amazing in January and February <laughs> in Colorado, aren't they? Oh, my gosh. The other day I was driving down the road looking into a ball field. I was like, oh, man, there's a coyote out there. That's sweet. And then I realized it was a cutout of a coyote to yeah. keep the geese off the field. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, bummer. <laughs> You pulled over thinking you were going to see some, like, Discovery Channel yeah, let's, action. Yeah. Nope. No. <laughs> Man, it's uh, it's interesting. Do you know in Celtic spirituality, so the early Celtic Christians considered the Holy Spirit, they call it the Great Goose? No, I did not know that. How crazy is that? I think of that every time I see geese now. The Great Goose. Yeah, because of its nature of, like, sporadic, wild, untamed... Yeah, the beauty of it. How cool. That's cool. Yeah, I like it. All right. Hey, we got a lot of things to talk about. First, if you would do us a huge favor, we have given you a lot of props for uh, going to find bread and the best eats in town or maybe some ideas. So can you give us a five-star review on iTunes at the Calvary Channel? We would love to get a five-star review from you over at Calvary Bible Church on iTunes. Please, it'll help the algorithm help other people find us. Um, that'd be a big help. Don't only, listen. only, only five star reviews. Only five. Yeah, if, if you think this is a four star show, <laughs> no way. Um, just go shut it down now. Hey, also we have uh, some events coming up at Calvary. You want to go to calvarybible.com slash events. Um, some great things happening this spring. We don't want you to miss out. Go to calvarybible.com slash events and figure out what you're going to get involved in here at Calvary this spring. Okay, let's stop all the fun tidbits there. Let's turn the corner and talk about John 10. Um, I loved your sermon from the Erie campus this last Sunday, Thomas. Also listen to John's online. It's so good to have John back, isn't it? It's great to have John. I've missed John over the last few months as he's gotten some rest, retooling, refreshment. Um, this is a sweet gift to elders and the church give some of our uh, pastoral staff a, a time of um, sabbatical. And so it's great to have him back, and he is enthusiastically um, welcomed back from the team, and he's re-energized, ready to go. And you could tell in his sermon he was excited to be delivering God's Word. Yeah, man, and uh, what a great sermon that was online. And we talked about Jesus calling himself the door or the gate, depending on what your translation is. Yeah. So explain where we were, where we were this last week, Thomas. So we are following the seven statements that Jesus makes in the Gospel of John. He says, I am, and that's equating him to the divine presence that we see in the Old Testament, especially we see revealed on Mount Sinai with Moses and God and the holy uh, hill when God just gives him the name I am. And Jesus um, is equating himself to be equal, to be the same, to be the one I am, who spoke with Moses and is speaking with the people um, in Israel. And so these different statements are alluding to his identity of how he has been with Israel all this time, the one who sees and knows the, the manna that has come down and fed them and, pr and provide for all their needs in the wilderness. That's the, I am the bread. I'm the bread. I'm the light of the world. Talking about the light that led them out of bondage into the land of promise. That was the festival of booth, which is basically the festival of camping, cam camping tents. Yeah, camping yeah. tents. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, we, we moved over to these two statements that are kind of tied together. They're not independent of themselves, where Jesus says, I am the gate or the door, and then I am the good shepherd. And what we looked at was the function of a good shepherd is actually to be the gate of a sheep pen so that sheep come in through one entrance, and the shepherd actually lays down in the evening and sleeps there so that he can protect the sheep against threats of wolves and thieves and robbers. 
and then to bring them out in the morning and bring them out to pasture and enjoyment of the day. Yeah, I think it's really important to realize that when Jesus is saying these statements, he's not saying them in like a vacuum. There's actually a context, a cultural ex understanding of what he's really saying. And sometimes it's hard, like shepherding, it's hard for Americans to understand what's going on. So let's maybe talk about first century Palestine. Hold on, what, what experience do you have with any sheep? Well, this is a little side story, but I spent a summer in Dublin, Ireland. So I was in the city doing youth ministry back in college, and we would go out of the city to the hills, the Irish hills. It is the most idyllic place on the planet. I mean, if if heaven looks like that, we got a really great time ahead of us. Um, wonderful. But one of the things was the sheep out there all had spray painted, had been spray painted. So instead of a brand like we know, and you know, I'm from Texas, when they brand a cattle, that's like a really harsh thing that they do. But in Ireland, they just spray paint them a certain color so you can know who's your sheep and who's not your sheep. And so the students and I would try to catch sheep that were roaming the Dublin hills outside the city. And it was really fun. Did you get one? No way. <laughs> they are dumb animals, but they are agile they animals. Are <laughs> they are agile and mobile. <laughs> yeah, it was really fun. And they were scared for their life for about 30 seconds until we yeah. gave up. Yeah. Or twisted an ankle. Yeah, on the <laughs> Irish countryside. But no, that's the only experience I have with sheep. So what about you? Do you have an experience with sheep? No. I was, I was trying to think <laughs> yeah. about that on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Of my limited experience <laughs> around sheep. Probably my only real tangible experience was mutton busting as a kid. Oh, you did it? Well, my mom made us do it. We yeah. Would, we'd go to local rodeos just for family fun. Yeah. And then you could sign up your kid. Yeah. Because that's what you did. My I little guess. one wants to do it. He's been watching YouTube videos. Yeah. So you get like a helmet, yeah. a, a vest, uh -huh. and then you hang onto the sheep. For dear life. For dear life. <laughs> Now, I don't remember how well I did. I assumed I won the rodeo championship. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you did. <laughs> Where's your belt buckle? Where's your belt buckle? I bet I fell off in the gate yeah. coming out. The gate probably like just took my head off. That's one of the best things about the rodeo is mutton busting watching. Because mm -hmm. it's so cute. Like it these little so these little guys and girls are just hanging on for dear life. Yeah. It's fun. All right. So with our um Yeah, <laughs> expert knowledge <laughs> yeah. of sheep. A deep experience. Yes. We do read, though. Yeah. And you, you've read some stories. Yeah. And some things. And I've watched some YouTube videos. Totally. And seen some stuff. <laughs> yep. You know, first century is uh, a very complex place. And this is why to be great Bible readers, you have to be really good historians um, and know the history of a, a place and a time. Um, and you should like history because it really adds to your biblical experience of reading God's word. But in first century, Palestine, the outside of uh, these towns, was a very dangerous place. I mean, think about it. It's high desert, rocks, um, there's thieves, there's um, robbers. In fact, you remember David was known for killing a lion and a bear as a shepherd. So like, he he really is living life at its Yeah, these fullest. are these are like the Liam Neesons. Yeah, totally. And so, the world. and it is very, it's very dangerous occupation. You're outside the city, you're outside walls, you're outside protection, and you're really just trying to survive in this occupation. And so, um, what we've learned is that the shepherds would actually gather together usually at night in order to help each other. I mean, if you're going to be the gate at night, if you're going to literally, you're going to take turns sleeping, you know what I mean? And um, you're going to take turns watching the walls of your sheep pen. So they would actually share sheep pens, what I've been reading, in order to provide a little more safety. Which makes sense if you think about like the birth narrative of Jesus. There's shepherds on a hill, which at night, which would be really cool because they would be together. And so in the morning, when it was time for them to wander the hillside to go get good grass and clean water, each shepherd would have a distinct noise, song, um, saying that would catch its own sheep's attention, which is why Jesus is saying, you know, those who know me will listen to my voice. And it just makes sense because he has seen this growing up in this context. Yeah, so here the, gives great insight to Jesus' words that he's going to call to his sheep. Right. Because there's a lot of sheep. I mean, he kind of, we talked about this on Sunday where 
if God were going was going to label us an animal, it wouldn't be the mighty lion, the beaver, otter, the golden retriever. Oh, that was funny because I was like, I bet people are just going to get set up because I knew where you were going because I had heard through the grapevine you were going to do that. Yeah. And uh, it was really fun. Were you offended? Not at all. When you found out you were a sheep? Um, and you said uh, a word that we don't say in my house. You, you know, it's funny. So I, I said that the sheep are dumb. Yeah. And my kids came up to me. They're like, Dada, why'd you say dumb? I said, because sheep are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, Dada. Like, Dada, you can't say that word. Yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, what words am I allowed to say in my own house? Totally. Um, no, they're in context. But... I was joking with Kristen afterwards. I'm like, yeah, sheep are dumb and they're smarter than me. But that's what sheep are. Right. And the Bible calls us the sheep. And really it's a term of endearment as well because you would know your sheep. Yep. You would call them by name. And so you have these mixed herds or flocks together in one pen, like you're saying. And Jesus says, amongst all the sheep that are there, I'm not trying to convince sheep. I'm not trying to acquire sheep. I know my sheep mm-hmm. and they know me. And I just call them out. Yeah. And they follow my voice. So let me, let me turn the corner here, too, to a little um, side note, a little sidebar rabbit trail. What do you think are some of the best biblical passages about sheep that, like, you, you've meditated on, your, your heart has sat in? Sheep or shepherds, or are they kind of similar? Same, same, yeah. Yeah. You know, John did a really nice job in his message that we'll talk a little bit more about this week when we highlight the shepherd uh, on the Erie campus and talk again about Jesus being the good shepherd, is that this is an imagery that is rich in Israel history. So Abraham was a shepherd. And then you have Moses, who was a shepherd, right, in Midian. And then he was called to be a shepherd of his people. And then famously, David was the shepherd. And so there's this picture of shepherd king and sheep people. Obviously, you you can't get too far besides Psalm 23. Which is a great Yeah, Lord is my shepherd, Yeah, and I shall not want. And then just walks through, what does it mean that the shepherd leads us in seasons of good and seasons of hardship, challenges, um, those, the word picture of even through the valley of the shadow of death. Like there's a shadow of death, meaning that there's still light there, right? His rod and his staff, they comfort me. Um, they provide for me. That lets me lay down and rest in security. He anoints my head with oil in the presence of my enemy. Uh, I think that's the, probably the clearest picture that I would meditate on. Right. Um, Psalm 23, again and again. Um, we, we talked about Psalm 100. Which says, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Yeah. I. That's like just so beautiful to me. Yeah, it really fundamentally changes what I'm doing in the world. Right. As I'm an under shepherd mm-hmm. where I'm going around trying to gather his sheep to say, mm-hmm. hey, here's the words of the Lord. Are there any sheep in this room that say, oh, that's his voice? I knew I belonged to the Lord. I know I belong to God. My heart's been oriented towards those things. That's who it is that I should be following. And then you just walk into your community. Here's the words of God. Now, I would imagine that um, there is some aspect where the enemy, as we see in uh, the book of Corinthians, has blinded, deafened the ears right. um, so that they can't receive it for, for certain times. But that's our role is under shepherds. I think, you, go ahead. Yeah, an interesting tidbit that I was reading on because I was looking through my, my library thinking about John 10 and what, what famous people have said about it. And I came across Desiring God by John Piper, and he, he uses John 10 as a missionary text for the, the call of the Christian to continue to declare Christ as the great shepherd and let his sheep come to him. So it's all in the context of like, you when you share Christ with someone, it's not up to you for the results. It's up to God. And it's up to the individual if they're going to hear the great shepherd's voice. Yeah. And so I thought that was really interesting when I was reading through sort of the library this week about um, John Piper using that as a sort of a missionary text of John 10. And it really gives life to like the nations. It's our call to the nations to go to proclaim, to talk about this great shepherd that's in Psalm 23 who laid down his life for his sheep in John 10 and really see it as our responsibility just to declare his name and share light about who he is. Yeah. And I I agree with you. I think that's the evangelism piece of being under shepherds or just being other sheep is you are proclaiming his voice through his words, um, talking about him, uh, doing studies with him, opening up God's word with others. And you're not trying to convince anyone to become a sheep. You're just asking, 
are you a sheep? Do, do you hear his voice? That's right. So that's the evangelistic piece. And, you know, Psalm 23 is a great picture of how he cares for us as the great shepherd. And so when, when I think of another text in the New Testament is 1 Peter 5, where Peter is exhorting kind of the leaders of the church. And he says, as fellow elders and witnesses of the sufferings of Christ, as well as partakers in the glory that is going to be revealed, then this is the charge. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those who are in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And so just that, that call that I would meditate on is in my own role is if there's something that people want to make up pastors, like, wow, they're like really great leaders. They're great CEOs. Look at how great they are at speaking or communicating or look at them as, as a visionary. I'm like, yeah, I think the clearest description of what I do is to be a shepherd, right. is to not sacrifice the sheep for my gain, but to sacrifice mine for theirs and to model what Christ is to us. Because I'm an, I'm, I'm an under-shepherd. I'm supposed to be shepherding like he has. And so those are that's another New Testament text that I would opt often think about in my own specific role. Yeah, and as a missionary text, maybe Luke 15, where Jesus in his famous parables about the sheep, the coin, and the lost son, is what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. I mean, that's a great, hey, we're just out there talking about trying to find that one out of the 99. And how great is it that Jesus accompanies his statement of, I am the gate. So I'm the, I'm the exclusive access into the family of God, and I'm the exclusive security to keep you in the family of God on the heels of what he had done with the blind man, right? Right. And I think when, when you start seeing these texts connected and seeing what Jesus is doing and then what he's saying, really it comes to life as, oh, he just modeled this. He was the one who left the 99, mm-hmm. went and found that one man who the religious leaders of the day as bad shepherds kicked out and said, you, you belong to me. That's a and, great connection. And the man, how did, how did he respond? is he heard his voice. Yeah. How cool is that? Oh, man, that's amazing. He says, well, who is he? And then just hearing the voice of Jesus says, saying to him, it's me, is I believe in it, and he worshiped him. That's the illustration of what's happening when Jesus gives us the spiritual principle of, I'm the shepherd, my sheep hear my voice. Did you guys just see what happened to this blind man? Yeah, and then I'm the gate as well, because you said something really interesting this week. Jesus is not just the gate to God. Jesus is God. So elaborate somewhat on that. Well, we were talking about the the criticism that's often attributed to Christianity as its exclusivity. Yeah. Right? So we're saying Jesus is the only way. We get nailed for that all the time. All the time. And the way it's set up is that there's a God, and it's not Jesus, mm-hmm. right? And so Jesus is one of the ways to God. So there really is a God, a, a, a spiritual creator, um, an omniscient, omnipowerful force, and, you know, Buddha has one picture of it. And there's if you think of like a trailhead to the top of Long's Peak, there are yeah. several ways to get there. You can choose different routes. And, you know, Jesus ends up being one of the routes. And maybe it's the more popular route, but he's one of the routes. The whole shift is then to say, no, actually, Jesus isn't, the, isn't a trailhead. Uh, Jesus is the God on top of the mountain. And he is the gate. So whatever way you get there... You have to come through Jesus because Jesus, as he says in John 10, I and the Father are one. Mm -hmm. As he later tells his disciples in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that's a fundamental shift for people to understand. Even like, um, I would say, non-Christian cults that claim Jesus, they don't see Jesus as God. They see him as brother of Satan, created being of God. And when you elevate Jesus as God, that's when you get to the exclusivity of Christianity. And it really is exclusive. Right. And that's where he got in trouble and we get in trouble when we say those things, too. Yeah, absolutely. Jesus is always in trouble. And I want you to notice that if you're getting ready for next week when we're talking about Jesus is the Good Shepherd, um, we'll talk about this on Sunday. But notice that after he talks about himself being the Good Shepherd, their response. Right. They want to kill him. Yeah, they want to kill him. And they like call him a demon. He's insane. Um, 
And that's different than when we hear Jesus is the good shepherd. Uh, John Boyle and I were talking about this yesterday, and John had pointed out, you know, in, in my mind, I think when, when we think of Jesus as the good shepherd, there's like this uh, beautiful like picture we have of Jesus, baby lamb. Yeah, because we've seen those paintings before. Yes, sentimental. It's old Sunday right? school classes. And when they see Jesus as good shepherd, you have to understand why, and we'll, we'll talk about this on Sunday, is he's a demon. Right. He's insane. we got to kill him. Right. So all of these claims are going against um, the religious leaders as gatekeepers. Yeah. For the purpose of Calvary, I think, and our friends listening today, um, one of the distinctions I want to sort of make in this text is that Jesus talks a lot about his voice and like the, um, him being different, the gate and the shepherd over the thieves, the robbers, the wolves. How does someone in today's culture living in January 2021 sort of know if they're listening to the great shepherd's voice? How would you like encourage us to think about that? Yeah. Um, you have to have a tuned ear, right? How would you know your parents' voice? How do you know your kid's voice? Uh, one of the things that I think about often is with my kids, there is this amazing experience that I've had four times now. So I have four kids, and every time they were born, I had the opportunity to be the one who really greeted them, held them, and spoke to them, right? Now, I always did something really, really stupid in the delivery room that would uh, make the nurses like just think I'm a moron. Really? Like, okay. what is that? So here's what happened. Then we'll get back to the serious stuff. Yeah. So they would, uh, you know, our daughters or our sons would be delivered, and then they would ask me, would just, you know, sir, would you like to come cut the umbilical cord? And I would say, oh, yes, I would. And so I go over there to cut the umbilical cord, and they hand me the scissors, and they, you know, they have it clamped off. And right. they're like, cut right here, sir. And I'm about to cut, and I say, hold on one second. And I shout across the room to Kristen, do you think he, they want an innie or an Audi belly button? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, they're like, just cut the cord. <laughs> come on. <laughs> <laughs> the looks, the looks from nurses, like this guy's a moron. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. This is the best. Anyway, but you're you're like one of the first voices, right? Now that they've ever heard, but they hear outside the womb, right? And you can watch as your child like turns to you and is recognizing your voice because you've read to them, you've sung to them, they've heard you yell in the house, right? Or, or at pray. the other kids. At the other like, children. Oh, that, that's dad's voice. Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to stay in here as long as I can. But it, uh, it, and I think that's how it gets tuned with, you know, we, you talked about the analogy of the sheep. Yeah. The shepherd comes in and mixed flocks, and with a call, their voice themselves, a song they would sing, sheep would follow. And you have to pay attention to God's voice. What does his voice sound like? And there's two real big things that tune our ears to the voice of God. One, what are the words that he uses? So there's the Bible again. Right. We talk about that every week. All the time. Yeah. Is be in God's word. Does this sound like the heart of God? Right. The clearest picture of who God is, remember this always, is Jesus Christ crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected. That's the clearest picture of who God is. That's the best picture we could ever tell you of God. It's his judgment. It's his love. It's everything wrapped in one. Right. And then spend time around the Psalms. Spend time around the Old Testament and New Testament. Cause remember, it's the same God. So get his words in you. And then the other thing he gives us is his presence, his Holy Spirit. So I'm going to give you the counselor, the helper, to remind you of my voice, remind you what I said, lead you in all truth. Those are the two elements. And as you spend more and more time in his word, listening to the Spirit's promptings in your life as a believer, that's when you tune your ears to the, to the Lord. Yeah, and I would say another one is make space for those two things because you need space. You need respite from the noise of the world to actually tune your ears and to have time for them to wake up to that voice that God is speaking to you in his word, through his spirit, and um, time with the Lord that's purposeful over and over again. And, you know, that doesn't happen overnight, does it? It's like a great running program to get you to to run a marathon. Whoever would want to do that, I don't know, but... You know, it's the baby steps. Can you listen to God's voice here and over and over again? And it becomes more and more clear. It truly does. Yeah, I mean, you think of even just Old Testament passages like Elijah wanting to see God, hear God, right? And he doesn't show up in 
the earthquake. He doesn't show up in this great fire. It's in this wind, right? Right. It's in the quietness that he sees him, sees the voice of God, yeah. or he sees God's presence. And so I think you're right. You have to carve out space. If you're just waiting for a massive earthquake to come in and speak to you, that's that's not historically, not impossible, but not historically how God speaks. Right. Or you take like um, Eli and Samuel, you need someone older, wiser than you to say that's God's voice. You know, and that's that night that um, in First Samuel 3 where they hear God's voice over and over again. Samuel like, here am I. And eventually Eli says, no, no, no. That's the voice. You yeah. need to listen to that. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true is you need a community of people to help you hear. Otherwise you get in this dangerous place you're like, God said to me. Yep. And without affirmation of the church, of a community to say, yes, that is God's, we see that in your life. We see that God's spoken that. That's affirmed by scripture. It's not contradictory to church teaching, you know, those sorts of things. Um, you can get a little wackadoodle. Totally. And one of the things about sheep is they are in community together to order to listen to the voice as well. And so that's to your point. There's no lone sheep christians in the world yeah you if you do that you are in trouble yeah absolutely and i think the other the other piece from sunday for me on the application piece that we're trying to do on this podcast is when jesus originally kind of opens up the gate and he's talking about thieves and robbers he's speaking to the religious leaders of that day yep and we are and on sunday as well we talked about the sheep entering the gate so the sheep have to come through jesus in order to be in his family but so do the shepherds who are sheep themselves kind of mm-hmm. in this analogy and there are a lot of bad shepherds that have creeped in. There are. They say, thus says the Lord, or I heard from God. And that's a dangerous place to be when you are a bad shepherd speaking on behalf of God to ill-informed sheep. Mm-hmm. What ways have you seen bad shepherds abuse sheep? Well, I think we talked about this even this week about technology, the blessing of technology, like the Bible translate in these languages we can post sermons at calvary bible to like youtube and like anyone in the world can watch them but there's also a danger because if you get on youtube and you do a search for a topic of the bible you don't know who you're listening to you don't know the context of actually is that a dangerous shepherd is that or someone who abuses those who are in his authority when the cameras are off does mm-hmm. that make sense and we've learned that sort of in christian culture over the last couple of years in our news cycles of bad shepherds and what they're doing and how power corrupts and how um, spiritual abuse happens. And many of us, as you alluded to on Sunday, have those stories, even in our own stories and the communities that maybe we found ourselves in before Calvary. And so one of the things is be careful in who you're listening to, who you're going to as you're, I would say, quote, spiritual shot in the arm for your Christian life. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Choose wisely on who you invest your time in. Yeah, and I think the way you kind of start determining who's um, a helpful, good voice is you kind of find those ones that are you know are true. Mm -hmm. Um, You begin, like you kind of developed what are helpful resources, and you kind of start building a barometer based on that of, okay, where do these people land in light of what I've heard about the Holy Spirit, of what I've seen them teach about God's Word. Um, Where do they land in communities with other spiritual leaders in America? Um, Are they friends? Are they not friends? Do they distance themselves from each other? That should give us an awareness of, okay, who's in community together? Who thinks this similar ways? Now, I am so blessed that there are digital resources because it gives you access to so many great voices. There are so many good shepherds out there, there too. There are. And just to be around those good shepherds also helps you hear the great shepherd. Right. So listening to them speak, these women, these men teach the scriptures, helps you see, okay, that's that's the voice of Jesus. Yeah. And I would say in my own life, I usually catch what's being taught, not actually listen to what's being taught. Does that make sense? Caught, not taught is that whole thing where actually I've learned to see shepherds and if they are producing spiritual fruit of joy, peace, patience, goodness, godliness, all those things that we're called to, um, if they are producing people 
getting pointed to Jesus and lives getting changed by their just interaction. I've learned from them personally. And so, you know, I think of my grandmother, um, the godly saint of a woman who prayed me into the kingdom of God. I really believe that. And her life was so different and so unique. And I caught what she was, she was teaching, not actually what she was telling me. Yeah. Their, their character builds a culture. Yep. And you catch that. Right. You know, there's probably very few sermons you'll ever remember uh, a pastor giving. There's very few sermons I remember ever giving. Right. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> but there's a culture that you create. And when you see the cultural DNA of pride mm-hmm. or compromise, lacks of humility, um, there's quest a, for power. Yeah. You just go, man, this is, this is not the good shepherd. Like the shepherd is the one who, as we're going to look at, lays down his life. There's the shepherd who sacrifices. There's the gate that is Jesus. And why are you creating all these other gates of what I have to do or what do I have to experience? Or he's out there to protect me. He or she is out there to protect me and to bring me into life. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good, man. What a great Tuesday. I'm encouraged. I really am, Thomas, by our conversation together. I hope you're encouraged at Calvary. We love you. Know that we're just continuing to pray for you in this season as you discern what is wise what is true, what is good, what is beautiful in the world. And just look to the great shepherd over and over again. Um, My friends can hear his voice. That's the great reminder for us today, right? Amen. All right, Thomas, anything closing words for us? Looking forward to being with you guys on Sunday. We're back in John chapter 10. Read it, reread it. And we're going to be looking at his statement that I am the good shepherd. Ask yourself this, what does it mean that he is good? What does good mean? and come prepared to engage uh, just a wonderful morning of worship and praise, times of prayer, times we just hear his words and to be able to unpack his scriptures. Yeah, your time won't be wasted if you continue to meditate in Psalm 23 this week either, right? It's a great psalm to read over and over again when you're having your first cup of coffee in the morning or you're about to turn out the lights for bedtime. Read Psalm 23, meditate on it, pray about it, look to the great shepherd. We love you, Calvary. Talk to you very soon, my friends.